Greetings, friends. My name is Pavel Stelmach, and now we will dive into the top news of this day. 37 years ago, the Chernobyl NPP accident left a huge scar on the whole world. The radiation leak turned a once cozy and developed area into an exclusion zone. Today, the 30 km zone around Chernobyl nuclear power plant remains a dangerous place with a high concentration of radiation. Last year, the occupier not only seized the nuclear power plant, but also endangered the entire world again. It's been more than a year after the liberation already. Scientific and security enterprises in the Chernobyl zone have already returned to normal operation. Today, Russia's barbaric attacks near Ukraine's nuclear facilities, the occupation of the Zaporizhia NPP and its transformation into a military base put the world at risk of a new disaster, the scale of which may exceed the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Every civilized country must remember the events and consequences of April 26, 1986, in order to resolutely fight the Russian nuclear terror of today. And the first step on this path should be the demilitarization of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and sanctions against the entire nuclear industry of the Russian Federation. Denis Mihal, Prime Minister of Ukraine, on Facebook. Ukraine and the world have paid a high price for the liquidation of the consequences of that disaster, which continues to this day. We must do everything to give no chance to the terrorist state to use nuclear power facilities to blackmail Ukraine and the world. The Russians never thought about the consequences. In 1986, Non-compliance with engineering rules and negligence led to the accident of the Chernobyl NPP, one of the worst disasters in human history. More than 600,000 residents participated in a liquidation of its consequences, and 5 million were affected. At the same time, the leadership of the USSR told through the media for several days that the accident was not terrible. It was just a fire and the evacuation of people began in a few days. Everyone was preparing for the celebration of May the 1st. A great holiday for the USSR. Just listen to the news from Moscow a few days after the accident. Some agencies in the West are spreading rumors that thousands of people allegedly died in the accident at the nuclear power plant. As already reported, only two people died. Only 197 were hospitalized, of which 49 left the hospital after examination. The work of enterprises, collective farms, state farms and institutions is proceeding normally. There are no gigantic destructions and fires, as some Western agencies write, as there are no thousands of deaths. Indeed, residents of nearby villages were evacuated. Although the radiation level has decreased over the past day, it has not yet reached the norm in the station area. Let me remind you that specialized units are cleaning the surrounding area from radioactive contamination. The accident happened, but to inflate its size, as some bourgeois media do, by spreading radicals rumors is hardly appropriate. From the Time program on the Soviet television. And while the world understood all the dangers that nuclear energy can bring, then the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant did not teach Russia anything. Last year, in the zone of exclusion, Russian soldiers dug trenches and habitually stole computer equipment and household appliances. And now Moscow has created the threat of a much higher disaster when it occupied the Zaporizhia NPP. Nevertheless, the West does not impose sanctions against nuclear power industry of Russia, despite that Russian authorities blackmail the world from time to time to use nuclear weapons against them. A nuclear bomb is possible, but not in the form that Russia threatens. I mean tactical or strategic nuclear weapons. This is really just blackmail, traditional for Russian politics. And civilian nuclear weapons in the form of the explosion on six reactors of the ZNPP is an absolutely realistic threat. It could be a terrible catastrophe, the consequences of which, given the territory contained with radionuclides, will far exceed the consequences of using, for example, tactical nuclear weapons. Yuri Kostenko, Minister of Natural Environment Protection of Ukraine, 1992-19. And we understand it, but Russia, as we see, not so much. The Kremlin shows utter disregard for the demands of the international community and specifically those of the International Atomic Energy Agency that is immediately withdraw its military personnel and other troops from the ZNPP. At the same time, Ukraine is making every effort to ensure that the ZNPP is safely operated. We continue to provide electricity to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant from the Ukrainian power grid, allowing for the operation of the nuclear facility safety system. 
the only way to restore nuclear safety and security in Europe is for Russia to withdraw its troops from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and hand over control over the plant to Ukraine. Today, Google Maps updated its satellite images of Ukrainian city of Mariupol, which is temporarily under Russian occupation now. You can see for yourself the destruction caused by Russian aggression. You can see the ruins of the drama theater. You can personally see the sun children in front of it, which is so big that any human on the plane could see it. The human, not Russian, sorry. It's hard for me to call them humans after all they've done. You can see the ruins of the Azovstal plant, the last Ukrainian stronghold before our soldiers laid down their arms by order of the command, because our command understood that it was necessary to leave the station and preserve Ukrainian lives. You can see all this on the internet, but not on the Russian television, where they talk about the restoration of the city and construction of new houses, and not about the destruction of the city itself, just as Bakhmut, Vukhodar, Avdiivka and Marinka are being destroyed right now, as already destroyed Popasna. Popasna is no longer officially considered by the occupiers as the city. Settlement is not among the city and municipal districts. In the so-called LPA, laws on administrative and territorial organization and on the formation of city and municipal districts on the territory of the LPA have been put into effect. In particular, 11 city and 17 municipal districts were approved. There is no Popasna in any of the lists. If earlier the occupiers only talked about impractically of restoring the city, which they themselves destroyed, now they confirmed their decision at the logistical level. Artem Lysogor, head of the Lugansk region state administration, in Telegram. It's simple. Once there was a city, and now there is none. And that is why Ukraine seeks real peace, not appeasement. Neither Ukraine nor its partners need peace at any price. Ukraine will not compromise its sovereignty or territorial integrity. No country in the world desires peace more than Ukraine. But we also know that real peace needs to be just and durable. Ukraine's vision of the path to such peace is both realistic and specific. President Zelensky outlined it in his peace formula, and we urge all nations to support specific points of the formula aimed at restoring peace in areas where Russia has shattered it. We have never sought this war. We seek nothing more than what we are entitled to under international law and the UN Charter. This is a realistic and rightful demand, and there is nothing maximalist about it. Russia may be saying it wants this war to end, but that means nothing without ordering commanders on the ground to end the swords. The Russian authorities are not seeking negotiations in good faith. Their statements are lies meant to freeze the war and rebuild strength for a new blow against Ukraine. Russia has not honored any agreements before and will not keep them now. Russia is still killing innocent people, destroying vital infrastructure and forcibly deports Ukrainian children. Russia doesn't appear to want to negotiate or end the war. Any foreign peace effort aimed at restoring Ukraine's internationally recognized borders, which have been violated by Russia, is welcomed. Any attempt to violate the principle, such as suggesting that Ukraine make territorial concessions or that the conflict will be frozen, it will be rejected. We are ready to discuss any peace plan that does not lead to freezing the conflict or to Ukraine handing over its territory to Russia. Suppose Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is ready to accept a coalition of countries seeking peace based on these two principles in his country. In that case, Kyiv is ready for discussion. Dmitry Kuleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Ukraine is now fighting not only for itself but for the entire free world. Our victory will be everyone's victory. It will profoundly transform not only the Euro-Atlantic space. Southeast Asia, Central Asia, the South Caucasus, Middle East, Africa and Latin America. Every region will see a change for the better once Russia is defeated. As a lesson to all would-be aggressors. If the history of the past century and the past decades is to teach us anything, the world needs real peace, not appeasement of the aggressor. Expert Group presents new action plan to enhance sanctions against Russia, 32 pages of the new document have 12 sanctions. We have explained the steps of the new punishment for Putin. 1. Strengthening sanctions on oil and energy. 2. Strengthening sanctions on non-energy trade. 3. Strengthening military sanctions. 4. 
strengthening technology sanctions, 5. Strengthening financial sanctions, 6. Confiscating Russian assets, 7. Increasing individual sanctions, 8. Designating Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, 9. Enhanced disclosure requirements, 10. Supporting business divestment from Russia, 11. Strengthening enforcement, and 12. Broadening the sanctions coalition. The documents of our group are now on the desk of all world leaders and all those involved in sanctions. I am proud that today the work of our group is the basis for more than 70% of the sanctions that have been implemented and are being implemented by the US, EU, UK and other countries. Andriy Yermak, head of the office of the president of Ukraine. I would like to note that this is already the second plan developed by the expert group and it continues the previous one. In particular, Ambassador Michael McFaul emphasized that despite the significant amount of work already done in the context of the sanctions, quite a few developments still need to be implemented. The experts focused on these areas in the process of preparing the updated plan. The areas of sanctions pressure proposed in the document are very specific. These are the most painful points of the Russian economy that should be pressed to reduce Russia's potential for military action. In particular, Mr. McFaul emphasized the importance of further sanctions against the Russian energy complex and defense industry, restrictions on the use of financial instruments, the issue of confiscation of the Central Bank of Russia's assets and their subsequent transfer to Ukraine, as well as other spheres reflected in the action plan. According to him, the sanctions regime needs to be enhanced, and the new document shows how sanctions can be implemented against the aggressor country. The world would be a much better place if Russia would behave decently and respect all members of the international community. Invading Ukraine, annexing Ukraine, and killing and kidnapping Ukrainian civilians are not behaving decently. Michael McFall, U.S. Ambassador to Russia 2012-2014 on Twitter. The head of the presidential office explained that Ukraine continues to communicate with partner states, in particular with the countries of the Global South, on strengthening the sanctions regime against Russia. According to Andriy Yermak, the leaders of these countries are well aware of the situation in Ukraine and therefore expectations regarding their resolve are quite high. That concludes our video for today. Thank you for staying with us and keep tuned for future videos. Goodbye.